finally we went and found a designer to redesign it. He did a beautiful job designing it. And that's kind of when Eric was getting involved. And, but, but, but you found a lot of issues with it because you were thinking in a way of how is this going to help us with sales? And so what he did, he gave us was something that was very pretty, but it didn't work for sales necessarily. So you were, you had that great insight of seeing all the issues, things that Ross and I would never notice. Hi, I'm Eric Schwartzman, author of The Digital Pivot, and this is the Earned Media Podcast. My guests today are Jennifer and Ross Halleck of Halleck Vineyard. Uh, this is a boutique winery that I've been working with for almost three years. And this is going to be an audio case study about the work we've been doing together. Jennifer Ross, welcome to the Earn Media Podcast. Thanks, Hi, Eric. Eric. Yeah, appreciate the invitation. Yeah, and I appreciate you guys doing this. So, Let's start with just a little, most people listening probably are not in the wine business, certainly not even in the luxury wine business. So tell us, if you would, a little bit about the luxury wine business. Well, I think the first thing we should um, describe is the overall wine business uh, to understand the luxury wine business. And the overall, the overall wine business includes everything that um, is made from the juice of grapes at, that is converted to alcohol. And that goes from um, the two buck chuck that used to get at uh, Trader Joe's. Um, in fact, the box wine, the even, even more, um, more generic, the box wine that you can get at your local grocery store up until the very fine French wines that sell for thousands of dollars a bottle. So the point in bringing that up is that the wine industry is really a lot of different industries. They, they have one thing in, pro in common, which is a product, but the channels of distribution, the customers, the types of relationships, um, and certainly the, the, the end product, the juice in the bottle is really quite different. And so the part of the industry that we occupy, very small part, the luxury wine business can be, uh, it's got m many definitions and in some, in some, by some definitions, we're not even in the luxury wine business. We're in the, like the semi-luxury wine business, uh, you know, wines that sell over a hundred dollars a bottle. Um, I think are represent the the pure luxury wine business, and in fact, we do have one wine that is in that category. But we're sort of just in that category of wines that sell sell between fifty and a hundred dollars, and so it's a um, a cherished but accessible luxury. And then you guys are tell us a little bit about your sort of your backstory because it's so interesting, sort of how you got into it and where you are now, Jennifer. Um, well, the way we got into it was, uh, coming up to Sonoma County from Palo Alto and looking for vineyard property and finding vineyard property in Sebastopol, which was an area that didn't have very much wine at the time. It was all north of us. And we bought a house and got married and planted an acre of grapes, which we thought was going to um, serve as a college fund for our sons. Right, Ross? Mm-hmm. And... Um, Rather but, whimsical notion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, Ross, you met uh, Greg LaFollette at kindergarten, back to kindergarten class, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell about that? Well, I think it was like like a, a some kind of parent teacher thing, um, or maybe it, it, I seem to remember it was maybe in the um, in the gymnasium of uh, the the middle school, and um, 
you know, Greg LaFollette at the time was kind of a rock star in the industry. He had, he was the winemaker for Flowers, which was kind of our first um, meteoric um, cult Pinot Noir from, from our neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I walked up to Greg and at that time we had, we had already had one crop that we had sold to somebody else from our, from our vineyard. And we had some wine. We had that, that, uh, winemaker made a couple of cases of wine for us from that, from our vineyard, the rest he blended into something he called his, his Sonoma coast blend. And I gave Greg that evening kind of sheepishly, you know, sort of like I was a little starstruck and said, Hey, M Mr. Mr. LaFalla, he's younger than I am. <laughs> and I said, would you mind, uh, you know, would you taste this wine and tell us what you think of it? And, uh, that, uh, uh, I expected not to hear from him in a week or two weeks, you know, like I thought people were always probably pulling on his chain and, having them try their wine. And, and we got a call from him at um, the very wee hours the next morning, um, woke us both up and he said, wow, I want to make this wine. Do you have any place that you're selling this fruit? Can I buy this fruit from you? And that's, that started a relationship that has really lasted till this day. And we still have a little bit of that wine, but he made that first wine under his label. And then he and I brought it in 2000 and well, it was a 2001 vintage. We brought it to uh, the Pinot, what was the name of that Pinot? The Pinot, Pinot Shootout. Summit. Oh, it was the Pinot Shootout. shootout. And it was in San Francisco and it had 317 other Pinot Noirs there. And you know, everybody walks around and tastes all the different wines. And that was still a place where I would tell people we're in Sebastopol. And they'd say, what is Sebastopol? They didn't even know. And now Sebastopol is like the hub for Pinot Noir. And Greg and I are in the very corner at the end of the night. People are still coming by to try that wine. And we're both a little drunk. And all of a sudden, someone nudges us and says, hey, your name just got mentioned. And we're like, what are you talking about? They go, you just won first place. And we are like, oh, okay. Incredible. It was incredible. So now, yeah. so now you guys uh, win first place. You know, you realize you're onto something. Let Talk to us a little bit more about the size of the industry. Because right now, how many cases are you making a year? About 2,500. And 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 most of these like big winers like E.J. Gallo and Kendall Jackson, they're making millions of cases. Millions and millions. Yeah. And, yep. and then there also are these, you know, when 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 you say the definition of a small winery, it's fifty thousand cases. So you yeah, guys, yeah, we, like we a just micro winery. Yeah, so in, in the micro winery category, you know, I just looked it up. It's funny you mentioned that. I just looked it up uh, the day before yesterday, mm -hmm. and the micro winery category, in legal terms, is fifty thousand gallons, which is about. Uh, 12 to 15,000 cases. Wow. The interesting thing is, you know, on, on Google, right, wine is wine. Like you, you can't, yes. if you search wine on Google, you're up against these giants, these huge companies uh, that are just making millions of cases. And so the, the prospect of digital marketing for a brand like yours could be daunting. Because, you know, you're a small winery. Yes, you're winning some awards and you have an exceptional product, but Google doesn't know that, right? They just know, you know, what's on the internet. Um, well, and, and the, the big wineries have big budgets and they have the capacity to buy advertising, which creates placement and relevance, um, albeit identified, it's still, you know, it's, it's daunting. Yes. Yeah. Daunting is the right word. So, so what's also really interesting is your sales channel because you guys don't sell in retail, right? Correct. Yeah. So so we originally, that? we originally used to use distributors for maybe 10 or 15 States. And that just proved we're just so small that it just proved not to be very good relationships, unfortunately. People loved our wine when we'd come into town. 
Then the next week, they're on to the next winery coming into town, and there was not any follow up. So, um, and especially during the 2008 downturn of the market, um, we just decided we cannot be doing that anymore. We have to go direct to consumer solely. So yeah. that's really where we've been since 2008. Is and there are thousands between in, in Napa and Sonoma. There are thousands of small family-owned wineries. Um, tell us a little bit about the the business model with the tasting rooms and the, the clubs and how that works. Well, most of the wineries that we know of, they own the vineyards. They own the winery building with all of the grapes and the processing materials inside and then attached to that they will have a tasting room and we don't we don't have any of those things we have just our our vineyard and then we have other people we pay other people to help us with all the other parts but we don't own any of those parts and how does it work how do you get a customer if you can't sell the product at retail well, we, you know, um, I think Jennifer answered a different question than you asked, which, um, but it's an important question to answer because what it suggests is that we are very nimble and that has allowed us to pivot uh, when things have been tough. And it, regarding how, how we get customers, well, you know, primarily we get customers through people finding us and then coming to our home and tasting the wine at our home, which is located on the vineyard, and then purchasing wine there and then becoming a member of our inner circle, which is our wine club. But um, to Jennifer's point earlier, uh, when COVID occurred, and I don't mean to jump the gun here, but it just describes this, this uh, nimbleness that we have. When COVID happened and the state shut down all of our tasting, you know, and in the case of many wineries who depend on that uh, traffic to come in and and um, and validate this expense that they have in their tasting room and all of their capital equipment, we were able to launch early into offering virtual tastings, and those virtual tastings turned into relationships with some very large clients like Citibank and Delta Dental. And those people bought literally hundreds of virtual tastings to stay connected to their people. And so we didn't have the, um, the, the, the overhead of um, keeping a tasting room staff and, and real estate and, um, you know, all of the other associated costs with owning a winery, we could uh, focus our attention on this new area of business development. So, so prior to the pandemic, your channels are primarily offline. People are coming to the tasting room. They're tasting the product there. They're becoming club members and buying it that way. That's how you're doing business. You have a website, but it's not really where you're seeing your revenue. And then the pandemic hits and you've got to suddenly reinvent yourself online. To your credit, you recognized and you put together a model that frankly we could afford because the model was tied to specific metrics that we could assign value to. And you became our coach for around eight to 10 months. And uh, Jennifer became your apt and, um, and enthusiastic pupil uh, student and uh, to guide our d digital marketing efforts. Yeah, it was interesting because at the time you had a e-commerce site on mm -hmm. a, a vertical solution that the wine industry has to host online uh, uh, e-commerce wine stores, but we didn't really have anywhere any way to do content marketing. So I, we we had launched that WordPress site, and then it was really you know with the launch of that site. Jennifer, that you and I started working together. And you remember some of the things we started uh, doing? Yeah. Did we do that? Site? Were we already doing that site when we met you? No. So when we first started, that site had not officially launched. And then we were, uh -huh. I was actually working with the designer 
yeah. number to get it to get it right before it mm-hmm. launched. Well, right. So after you know, fifteen years, the the website that we had was pretty pathetic, and um, finally we went and found a designer to redesign it. He did a beautiful job designing it, and that's kind of when Eric was getting involved. And but 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 you found a lot of issues with it because you were thinking in a way of how is this going to help us with sales? And so what he did, he gave us was something that was very pretty, but it didn't work for sales necessarily. So you were, you had that great insight of seeing all the issues, things that Ross and I would never notice all the issues of, of what's wrong with that part of the website. People are clicking too much or we can't get this on, you know, we can't upload this data onto the Google Analytics or whatever. All these things I would never have any idea about. And we worked on all that stuff for so long. Um, It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. And, you know, you kind of kept talking about, well, first we're going to do the. I can't even remember. You have like four points. First, you're going to do this. Then you're going to do this. Then. Then you're going right, to do right, content from, media, and then you'll the do book, earned the media. And then pivot, and and right. the, 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 my um, uh, methodology is owned media first, shared media second, earned media third, paid media fourth. So what's our owned media? The website. Correct. And then what's the second one? Shared media, social media. Oh yeah, we're we're still not super big on social media. We really that's something we can work at. And then the I'm third not sure is that the, it's that important. And then the third is the earned media. Earned media, which is PR. And so that's really when things began to take off because after you and I worked on all these technical things and we got different computer people to come in and help us. Well, do you remember the, just just to break it down some <laughs> of the things that we did when we were getting started? Specifically? Well. well I kind of remember you saying when you go in and make a page, you have to go and do this. And you had like all these steps I had to follow. And, and truthfully, it all went over my head a bit. And I started following you, what you wanted me to do. But it was really, um, it was really hard for me to understand it all. And I would do it, but I really didn't understand what I was doing. So at the end of the day, you ended up hiring people and kind of took it off my plate, truthfully. Do you see it that way? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you know, at the time, you know, we were trying to keep the costs low. So yeah. that's where the coaching relationship made a lot of sense. Also, because getting a lot of the initial foundational work done that needs to be done in order to compete in content marketing and in search marketing takes time. And so mm-hmm. rather than, I think, you know, have a have a bulky retainer with an agency that's going to burn you down, a coaching relationship makes more sense because then you actually get it done and the time spent is the time getting the work done. Then when you're in position, then you can throw gas on the fire and crank it up a little bit. Right. So um, it was really great when you took it off my hands because I, I wear way too many hands. And that's when I really noticed everything taking off. We started moving into all these creative ideas that you have for creating content, you know, starting with the blog and writing the Sonoma wine tasting report and so many different things that, that would then other people start and in the blog, like other people started reading the blogs. And then coming to our site because we were writing the blogs about interesting things, not about ourselves, but about interesting things that other people wanted to read. Um, it was it was really wonderful. And immediately, you know, when we started, I think that on a monthly basis, we had like 450 people coming to the site or something. And the next thing I knew, we were at 15, 16,000 people a month coming to the site. But what we really realized, I don't know if you want me to keep going on with this, but what we really realized is that we were reaching people, but they weren't necessarily the right people. And so then we kind of regrouped and made our content more specific to our um, desired customers. 
Um, and, and that's kind of where we're just past that part. And now the last little bit of your um, book would say, now you move into paid media, which we haven't done at all yet. You know, we have all these people coming to our website and we haven't paid anybody any money for people to come. It's all been... Actually, we just launched our first ad today. Yeah, okay. So here we are. We're just starting. Right. Yeah, so, we have our, so 28 months into it, we've come full circle. We've mm -hmm. got the owned covered. We've got the shared covered. We've got the earned covered. And now we're doing the paid. And, you know, and, and, and what the change is, is that, you know, Russ and I are very happy what we're doing. We love our products. We love meeting everybody. We're really about building community through wine and meeting everybody who tastes our wine. And, and we love our positions. Um, but uh, what's really just been great is all the interesting ideas that you've brought into, into the whole process. Well, tell, us, and, tell me a little bit about the Sonoma Wine Tasting Report. I think that was a really interesting sort of case study and project that we did together. Right. Um, well, that was about COVID and how the tasting room has changed pre and post COVID. And it was specifically about how much money people were paying to do tastings and also how many people could just walk into a tasting versus how many had to make appointments. And so you did a lot of research on that to- um, Right, we did primary research, collecting mm -hmm. all that data. We right. hired data scientists to analyze it. Um, we hired a designer to create visualizations of the data. I wrote the report and then we released the Sonoma Wine Tasting Report um, and uh, do you remember some of the news coverage we got from that? ABC News and San Francisco Chronicle, uh, the wine, wine business, um, uh, Sonoma County Gazette, Wine Searcher, the, the, the drinks business, the Press Democrat, Somalia Times. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it, you hit a nerve. And I think the nerve had to do uh, with, it, it coincided with, um, with, uh, inflation. And so there were a lot of contributing factors and people were very interested in the economy. People were very interested in how they were spending their time. People were getting out again, you know, after COVID and starting to, you know, move around. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, um, key indicators of the shift from pre to post COVID was a rise in prices on the part of wineries in their tasting rooms. And they, they, it was quite significant. And as well, the, um, the requirement to make appointments uh, changed the entire landscape of the, the, the tasting room experience. And, and if you remember, the reason that I said I wanted to do the report is not necessarily because consumers are going to read it and, and buy wine, but rather it was going to get high profile news media atten uh, attention that would, you know, increase our visibility. And so it was a deliberate marketing tactic to get the attention of the wine industry and of wine reporters who have the power to drive traffic. Yes. And it was interesting because some of our colleagues questioned whether we were actually, in fact, hurting the industry by shining a light on the increase in prices and the lack of availability of tasting room services. And it's interesting to take that perspective because I think that it suggests that people aren't paying attention. And, and I think that people are paying key, you know, keen attention and the result has been of their paying attention, the tasting room traffic has dropped precipitously in the last months. And uh, the, the good news or the irony in that, or maybe the case study um, uh, response to that 
for you is that our our attendance has gone up this year by 29%. So while the entire industry is 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 singing the blues and talking about how can we get people back, we are actually in experiencing a, a, a pronounced increase in visitation. Well, the other thing too is that um, this kind of feeds into that is that when we first started working with you, Eric, the metric that we were basing everything on was how many people could we get on our email list? And, you know, over time, we just all realized that selling a high luxury brand like wine, people want to experience it in person. They want to taste it. They want to meet the people who are making it. And so what was really great is that we all recognized that using the metric of email signups was not going to be a good metric. And what we're really more interested in is getting people into our tasting room. And yeah, and so as Ross said, that has gone really well. And that's really all thanks to the online presence that you've given us on the internet. And then um, in terms of, you know, what's so interesting is that you're know, doing 2,500 cases a year that we're able to outrank so many of these giant brands for, for keywords that are unbranded like Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, we are ranking above companies that sell millions of cases a year for those for those wine varietals, which is just shows you how either asleep either how good we are or how asleep at the wheel they are, or perhaps a combination of both. Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Because I think that um, the industry has not yet fully transitioned. You know, it's an old industry. I mean, you if I mean to put it into context, they discovered uh, in October of 2017 they discovered a clay pot in the Republic of Georgia on the Black Sea that had remnants of wine in it that was dated 10,000 years old. And so that's 3,000 years before Mesopotamia and the birth of civilization. Now that puts a context into how long, how big, and how broad the wine industry is. It's been going on a long time. And so for the, a wine, a, an industry that is, is as embedded in the human experience as wine, it takes a long time to pivot. And there are these, you know, the three-tier distribution channels. There are these tried and true and embedded methods of capturing and earning customers that um, again, getting back to our earlier point, we are not so saddled with some of those um, constraints. And so we're, it's easier for us to pivot. And so, you know, thanks to a great extent in your insights, Eric, and, and you're being ahead of the curve, um, we've been able to jump ahead of these brands because it's like turning the Titanic for them. You know, a lot of small businesses really struggle with content marketing because there is so much advanced work that has to be done to trim the sails and get the boat in position. But once you catch the wind in search marketing, you can sail the, the world for free. You know, with, with <laughs> advertising, you know, as this, the minute you run out of money, the boat stops. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, um, but so many small businesses use advertising because it's immediate. You spend the money, you get the sales, but then you stop spending the money, you don't get the sales. Of course, if you can get yourself in a position with this long-term approach, which you guys, you know, took, now you're really in position to cruise. Why do you think it is you had the, the faith and the resolve to stick with it? Well, because we saw results early on. I mean, it wasn't as if it wasn't like blind faith. Um, and I think that Eric, uh, you know, the results that we were marking were like small incremental steps. I mean, we could see our website getting better. We could, we could look at these little maps, these little, uh, these little uh, animated maps of how people were, were um, 
uh, perusing our site. And we could see that this, this little tweak here could make their journey more efficient. And so we were constantly watching these little incremental steps of getting better. And so um, I'd say the initial contract, the initial engagement was blind faith. I mean, there was a certain amount of blind faith in that. But again, you framed it, you packaged it in a way that we could kind of test the waters and see, you know, see how the relationship went. You know, we weren't, um, we weren't being handcuffed to you. And um, you demonstrated, you know, uh, your gifts pretty early on, and they were perfectly suited to our needs. Well, you know, before the internet, and before TV, right, and before magazines, you know, all you had were signs that you could put up to attract people, you know, and then you do have the newspapers, you have the television ads, but now it's all about being online. And if we were not ahead of the game online, we would just feel lost. We would feel like we're not part of the system. And I feel really great that we can feel so proud of what we've accomplished online and that we are, we're really attached to it. We've, I mean, you truthfully do most of it, but it gets to represent us. And so if someone I know goes to um, look us up and finds us or goes to our website, I'm very proud of what we put out there. And I would be very embarrassed if they were looking at what we had two years ago. What do you think it, it adds to the value of your business to have the web presence that you have? Oh, boy. I, I think it's a tough thing to quantify. But um, to Jennifer's point, I think there's a certain confidence that we now have that we certainly didn't have before. And when we're talking, you know, the value of the business. I mean, it, that that's such a that's such an interesting term. The value of the business could be quantified by how much our business has increased, and we've had pretty consistent growth, pretty consistent and persistent growth over the last five years. Well, more will be revealed. Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do this and and talk about the work that we've done together. Uh, to share it with uh, the community uh, so that others uh, can see the path that we've taken and maybe be inspired to do it themselves as well. Well, Eric, we love having you on the team and uh, we are in awe of what you've done for us. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And you're really good at putting together cheese and charcuterie plates too, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Yes. <laughs> and, and cutting 20 pounds of beets. Yeah, so yeah. so you may have missed your calling, but well, that's another topic. We could do another <laughs> podcast on beat. Cutting. You know what? I'm glad I missed that calling. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs>